Good morning, Serenity. Isn't it good to be in his house? What a beautiful day he has given us to worship him in spirit and truth. We are glad that you are here today. Make yourself at home. And uh, just a few announcements want to remind you of. One is July the 25th through the 28th, 630 to 830. We'll be having our family fun fest. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, those that were able to come out Thursday night and pass out flyers in a neighborhood. We thank you so much for that. And we're looking forward to what God's going to do during that time. We're going to have a wonderful week, okay, Monday through Thursday, uh, during that time for our Family Fun Fest. Tribute Quartet, August the 21st at 6 p.m. Love Offering will be taking to defer the cost of having them in. Our fall revival with Brother Rick Carter will be the September the 14th through the 18th. On the 18th, we will be celebrating the church's 37th anniversary and we'll have dinner on the grounds, okay, uh, during that day. September the 26th through the 30th, today is the cutoff day. Those of you that want to go on the joy trip, okay. The 26th through the 30th, sign up today, get your $60 deposit into me so that we will be paying the quartet convention tomorrow, okay? So please be mindful of that. It's $385 for the week, plus or minus a few meals that you'll be on your own for and some uh, gratuities, but we'll be going to three shows, our lodging, Four meals, a breakfast provided, and then the National Quartet Convention on Wednesday and Thursday evening. So uh, please be mindful of these announcements. This coming Thursday night, 6.30, we'll be having another visitation blitz. So if you can come and help, please do so. So all we're doing is walking around the neighborhoods and putting door hangers on the doors that have some invitations on them for our Family Fun Fest, okay? And uh, I appreciate those that were able to come and to participate in that. You ready to sing praises unto the Lord? Oh, a little more enthusiasm, church. Are you come ready on, to church. sing praises to the Lord? All Let's right. do that. Let's stand if you would, please. What a mighty God we serve, amen. We still have have those that are recuperating from procedures. We have those that are traveling, that are out on vacation. Let's pray that the Lord will give them journey mercies, bring them back to us. And let's just ask God to work in our hearts and lives. Did you come to receive a blessing today? If you came to receive a blessing, He'll give it to you, but you need to be ready to receive it. Okay? So let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask Him to bless today. And that everything said and done would bring honor, glory, and praise to our Savior Jesus Christ. Okay? Brother Martin, lead us in prayer, would you please? Lord, we come to you and uh, thank you. We're thankful for everything that you've done for us. Lord, we just want to keep you on our mind. And Lord, let's just praise you. Uh, We're thankful for Brother Wallace making it back today. We're thankful for everybody that's here. And we just pray for everybody's health. And uh, we're just grateful for everything you do for us. I pray this in the Lord's name. Amen. 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 Thank you. You may be seated. We are are certainly glad that you are here with us today. And if this is your very first time here at Serenity Baptist Church, you did not get a visitor's card when you came in, 
Would you be so kind as just to slip your hand up? We might have a record of your visit. Anybody? Right over here, Brother Terry, and right here. Ladies, thank you so much for being here today. Make yourself at home. Right over here, Brother Terry. Anybody else? Right over here. Then there's another family. You got those, kid? Thank you, buddy. Thank you so much. If you would, fill that card out. And in just a moment, we are going to have what we call our penny march. And uh, you can take that card and put it in that plate as it's passed. It's just loose change that goes to our kids' ministries. We'll use it for vacation Bible school, for Christmas, Easter activities for the kids. And um, you can place it in there or you can place it in the tithe boxes that are in the back of the auditorium. And may I say, please do not forget, church, that uh, we need to be faithful in giving back to God that which is already rightfully His, okay? So please be mindful of that if you would please. Brother Warren, if you'd come with the penny march, please.
entitled to serenity this morning.
Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come. Just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot to to Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily Thank you, Miss Jen. And that is our prayer today, that if you do not know Christ as personal Savior, you'll surrender to His love today and His sacrifice. Take your copy of the Word of God and stand with me as we honor the reading of the Word of God and turn to the Song of Solomon, chapter number 5. The Song of Solomon, chapter number 5. I want to begin in verse number 8 of chapter 5 of the Song of Solomon. Not many preachers will delve into this book because of the nature of the book, because of the sensuality of the book. But at the same token, I think that we need to look inside of this book this morning and glean some things from its pages concerning our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In chapter number 5, beginning in verse number 8, it says, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if ye find my beloved, that ye tell him that I am sick of love or faint with desire. 
What is thy beloved more than another beloved? O thou fairest among women, what is thy beloved more than another beloved that thou dost so charge us? My beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among ten thousand. His head is as the most fine gold, his locks are bushy and black as a raven. His eyes are as the eyes of doves by the rivers of waters, washed with milk and fitly set. His cheeks are as a bed of spices, his sweet flowers, his lips like lilies, dropping like smelling myrrh. His hands are as gold rings set with the beryl. His belly is as bright as ivory overlaid with sapphires. His legs are as pillars of marble set upon sockets of fine gold. His countenance is as Lebanon, select as the cedars. His mouth is most sweet, yea, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for each person that is in this building today. Father, I know that there are others that cannot be here because of illness. I pray, dear God, that you would intervene. But Father, I also understand there are those that could be here that are not. And I pray to God that you would speak to their hearts. I pray to God that you would work in our lives. May the Holy Spirit not be quenched or hindered in any way. And Father, I pray that you would honor your word today. We understand that it will not return void, but it will accomplish whereto it is sent. Dear God, I pray that if there's one here that doesn't know you as Savior, that they'll not leave this building without trusting our blessed Savior. For it's in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. In the book of the Revelation, in chapter 19, verse number 6 through 8, it says, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering sang, Alleluia! For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to Him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and His wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints." And he said unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. This morning I want to do something that should honor our Savior. I want to brag on Jesus. I want to brag on Jesus. If you take and study the Word of God, one of the things that you're going to know is that God betrothed the people of Israel to Himself. And as He betrothed the people of Israel to Himself, He entered into a covenant with them, and it was a marriage covenant. A marriage covenant. And He had given abundant proofs of His love to them, and required of them that they should love Him with all their heart and with all their soul. If you go back into the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 6 and verse 5, that is spoken of and given to them by the statement of, that thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. It's reiterated in Deuteronomy, chapter number 30 and verse 20, where it says that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey His voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto Him, for He is thy life and thy length of days. As you go through and you study the Song of Solomon, you're going to find out that it is a book of songs. 
that it is a book of poems. That is, it's an allegory or a parable. And we know that an allegory is a story, a poem or a song that reveals a hidden message. A parable is a what? It is an earthly story that has a heavenly meaning. And may I submit to us this morning that the Song of Solomon, even though it is, it is passed over many times, is a love story between God and the children of Israel, but it's also a love story between God, Jesus Christ, and the church. And we cannot negate that fact. We can't push it aside. It is a symbolic illustration of God's love for His bride. This book is a love story. It pictures that. Because if you go back into the beginning of chapter number 5 with me, I want you to look in chapter number 5 and beginning in verse number 1. And we're going to read down to verse number 7 because I want us to get a glimpse of this love. He says, I am come into my garden, my sister, my spouse. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drank my wine with my milk. Eat, O oh friends, drink, yea, drink abundantly, O oh beloved. Now look at verse 2. I sleep, but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled. For my head is filled with dew, and my locks with the drops of the night. I have put off my coat. How shall I put it on? I have washed my feet. How shall I defile them? My beloved put in his hand by the hole of the door, and my bowels were moved for him. I rose up to open to my beloved, and my hands dropped with myrrh, and my fingers with sweet-smelling myrrh upon the handles of the lock. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. My soul failed when he spake. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him. But he gave me no answer. The watchmen that went about the city found me. They smote me. They wounded me. The keepers of the walls took away my veil from me. The bridegroom has come to the bedchamber of his bride. He has come to spend some time with the love of his life. And when he arrives, she's asleep. And he bangs on the door, and he tries to awaken her, but she does not wish to get up and to let him in. May I say this, church? There needs to be an awakening unto those things of the beloved. She laid in bed. She did not get up. We as a church body should want to spend time with our beloved. Why is that? Because he longs for us. And he reaches in through the opening of the door in verse number 4, and he begins to plead with her. Revelation chapter number 3 and verse 10 says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And if any man will open unto me, I will come in and sup with him. Can I say to the local New Testament church today, can I say to Serenity Baptist Church, our beloved wants to meet with us. He wants to commune with us. He wants a relationship with us. But we have to be mindful of this relationship and be willing to awake out of our sleep 
to open the door and to invite him in so that he can be part of what's going on with us. But she laid there. She wouldn't get up. But then after a while, her heart is stirred by his love for her. And she rises to allow him to enter. In verse number 5 and 6, you'll notice I rose up to open to my beloved and my hands dropped with myrrh. The custom of that day was that when a man would call on an individual and they did not open the door, that they would leave a calling card. Now, if I've made a visit to your house and you were not home, you would probably find a card stuck in the door or my business card stuck in the door or a track stuck in the door from the church. Most of the time, you'll leave a note or a calling card when you go to visit somebody and they're not there. If I go to a hospital room and that patient is asleep, most of the time I will not wake them up I will leave my card on their table next to them. When somebody went to the door of their loved one, the one that they loved, their calling card was a fragrance. They would leave, in this case, some type of perfume smell, or they would gather flowers. Do you remember, gentlemen, back in the day, when you would court somebody, what would you take to the door? And you would hold up this set of flowers to give to them. And it, you, they would smell, oh, they just love those roses. They love the smell of the roses. Back in that day, they would leave a fragrance. But the problem was this. The fragrance was there, but he was gone. He had departed. She did not open unto them. And because she did not open unto him, may I say that he left. I'm going to say this as a pastor. There are a lot of churches today where God is not present. I mean, we've been in places where you go into the first church of the deep freeze, pastored by Jack Frost, and you skate in and you skate out. (laughs) Nobody shakes your hand. There's not a warm welcome. They sit there with the mentality, there's nothing you can say today, preacher, that's going to bless me. But all the while, God's wanting to meet with His people. All the while, God is wanting to commune with them. All the while, he's standing there beating on their heart's door going, Hey, I want to sup with you. I want to come in and commune with you. But yet, what's the mentality? Lord, uh, when I get around to it, I'll open the door. And then by then, he's gone. And then you try to yell for him and there's no answer. There's no communing and there's no answer. She calls him. She looks for him. But she cannot find him in verse number 6. And while she searches for him in the late night, she's mistaken for a woman of the evening by the city guards and is mistreated in verse 7. I want to ask this question of all of us because they treated her as an adulterer. But the Bible speaks to us over in James chapter number 4 and verse 4 about us committing spiritual adultery. He says, ye adulterers and adulteresses. He's not talking about those that have gone out and have participated in things of ill repute. He's talking about those that claim to know Christ as Savior that mingle with things of the world and put God on the back burner. That's what he's talking about. And we have become adulterers and adulteresses 
in this wicked and perverse nation, the Bible says. And what has happened is, is that we've joined on to their philosophy of thinking. And we've joined in to their mental state today. And it has been drugged into the church. And all the while, God is saying, pay attention to me. I want to commune with you. I need your attention. And then when the church gets to the point where they're saying, okay, we messed up. What has taken place? He's gone. He's gone. How many times has Jesus come to us? How many times has He longed for our attention and our love? How many times has He wanted to spend time with us? But how many times have we turned Him away? How many times have we been too busy? How many times have we been caught up in our own ambitions and our own thoughts? How many times where it wasn't convenient for us and we've treated Him as a 7-Eleven, as a convenience store, that I'll get to you when I've got time. See, He knows what we've missed. But who knows what we've missed by not being receptive to His advances. As you go through and you read this allegory of chapter 5, you're going to see that this dream is so vivid that it awakens a desire within her for her beloved. Just by the wording of the portion of Scripture, it shows us the idea that she's half asleep and half awake. Anybody been, been there, done that? You wake up at 4 o'clock because your body tells you it is time to go do something. And you get up, and what do you do? You kind of stagger across the bedroom. You see the night light in the distance as a, as a lighthouse in the middle of the ocean, and you go and you do your business, but are you fully awake? No. <laughs> Thanks for waking him up. <laughs> but you're not fully awake. You're half in it and half out of it. You're dreaming. Every one of us in here has had dreams of what we feel like we've been right in the middle of everything. And we're half asleep. Here she is, she's half asleep. And in an effort to find him, she now enlists the help of some of the young women in town. Verse number 8, look at this. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if ye find my beloved, that ye tell him, that I am sick of love. That doesn't mean that I'm sick of love in the, in the sense of, I don't like you no more. That she is sick with desire for him. Now, you can get a picture of her wandering the streets. You can get an idea of her wandering the streets. As she begins to look for him, and she begins to go about, I need some help to find him. Have you seen my beloved? Have you seen him? I, I, I went to open the door, and I, he, he had left me. He left the myrrh, the fragrance there, but now he's gone, and I'm trying to find my beloved. Has anybody seen my beloved? frantic search and they begin to ask him what is so special about your beloved Judy's asked that question about Charlie often <laughs> what is so special about your beloved well if you look at the scripture we read this morning you're going to see what is special. See, their, their 
response was one of sarcasm. In verse number 9, What is thy beloved more than another beloved? O thou fairest among women, what is thy beloved more than another beloved that thou dost so charge us? What is so special that you're charging us to go find him? That you're challenging us to seek him out? What is so important about him? Well, I can almost hear her reply. See, you don't understand. My beloved is enduringly strong. My beloved is entirely sincere. My beloved is eternally steadfast and immorally graceful and imperally powerful. And in partiality, he's merciful. See, you guys don't understand. My beloved is one that has power and that is called the king of the Jews, that is the king of Israel and of righteousness and of judgment to come, that my beloved is the king of all ages and the king of heaven and the king of glory. Do you understand what I'm saying today? That's our beloved. That's our beloved. That our beloved is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. That he's the greatest phenomenon that's ever been given to man that has ever crossed the horizons of this world, that he is God's son, that he is the sinner's savior, that he is the centerpiece of civilization, and he stands in solitude of himself. Do we get a picture of our beloved? That he's unparalleled and unprecedented. That he is the loftiest idea in literature and the highest personality in any philosophy. That he's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. And he is the miracle of the ages. Can you see her given a description? Why is he so important? See, that is just the opening the bride needs. She's so filled with love of her beloved that she begins to tell them why he is so great. What description would you give your Savior today? Could you say these things I just said? See, the Bible goes through and tells us about the description of our Savior There's not one promise he has not kept in our lives, is there? That would be, you're right, preacher. There is not a promise that he has not kept for us. There's no love any greater than the love that he has for us. There was no sacrifice that it was ever given. There was no righteous that was ever imputed unto man. Any greater than our Savior, Jesus Christ. There was no grave that held our Savior that could ever hold Him. You know, there's a lot of slang terms that have been used for a long time. I think, if, and some of you correct me if I'm wrong, okay? Back in, back in the 50s, okay, back in the 50s, what was one of the slang terms, Brother Mike, that was used? But when, when, a, when a girl would give a description of their boyfriend, did they call him dreamy? Huh? Some of you, oh, dreamboat. Dreamboat. How about in the 60s? Cool? Groovy? 70s? They were hip. They were hip. In the 80s. Huh? Far out. In the 90s? What about the 90s? How about awesome? What would it be today? 
Spencer, what would it be today? I mean, huh? Sick. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's sick. He's sick. Or he's dope, man. <laughs> Song of Solomon, yes. But see, isn't that we use terminology like that? Back a few years ago, it was he's all that. And a bag of chips. He's all that. But see, there were all kinds of slang terms that were used to identify individuals, boyfriends. And see, he goes through and he says, if this Shulamite woman was here today and were to tell you about this special individual, what would they say? I think that they would say that There's nothing like him. There's nothing like him. Because he's special. He's special because his life is matchless and his goodness is limited. Limitless. That his mercy is everlasting and his love never changes and his word is enough and his grace is sufficient and his region is is everywhere and his reign is righteous and his yoke is easy and his burden is light. In verse number 10, we begin to get the character of the bridegroom. Because it says, My beloved is white and ruddy and chiefest among 10,000. When he speaks about white and ruddy, he's not just speaking about color. He's not speaking about color at all. Even though ruddy in the Old Testament is a color of red. But what he is speaking about is he, she gives a description of her beloved and says that he is pure. That he is pure. Because white is the color of purity, is it not? Ladies, when you got, when you got married, or if you're going to get married, what do you do? You put on white as a sign of purity. Nowadays, it's not that way. In the sense of the purity part. They may wear white, some are, some are not. But at the same token, when it comes to the Lord, we know that He's pure. That there's no sin in Him. None at all. And that's what the Bible speaks about as white is that purity. Ruddy is the description of a person in the bloom of health. And this woman looks at her beloved as the essence of purity and health. And she says, you know what? He's holy. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 5 says, And ye know that he was manifest to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Folks, I want to tell us all right now that if Jesus Christ would have sinned, we would yet be in our sins and would not have a Savior. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, For He hath made Him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. As a pure, holy man, Jesus was able to lay down His life, to pay our sin debt on the cross, to shed His blood that we might have eternal life. John 10 verse 15 says, As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. The next description that was given by her was that of Ruddy. 
Jesus is the picture of manliness. Did you catch that? He's not like the pictures depict him as some anemic weakling. He was not the little man portrayed by the artist's brush that many describe him as today. Jesus was a man's man. You say, well, how do you know? Because his muscles had been toned by the carpenter shop. That his stamina had been strengthened as he walked across the mountains and through the valleys of Palestine, teaching and preaching and telling about the Messiah that had come. Can I throw this in here and it won't cost you any extra? We need to, some men today to be men. What? We need some men today to be men and not snowflakes. We need some men that are going to rear up their family the way God intends them to be reared up. That when they stand before God and give an account for what they've done in that home as the leader of that home, that they can do it unashamedly saying, this is what I've taught my kids. That's what the Bible says. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. See, the Bible tells them, tells us that we should nurture our kids in the admonition or the ways of God. Why is it that kids do not want to be in church by the time they're 18? It's because their parents have taught them what? That church is a non-essential. Is a non-essential. Because the Bible speaks about that today. Even in our lives. Oh, preacher, is the Bible relevant for today? Oh, it's more relevant than it's ever been. It, it's truer now than it's ever been in our minds. Why? Because everything that the Lord has told us in the Scripture is coming before our eyes, being predicted and shown to us. And what have we done? We're like the gal where he comes and he knocks on the door and we lay in bed until we all of a sudden, oh, that was the Lord. When he comes, will he find us sleeping? Will he find us awake? See, he was a man's man. He was one that did that which was right. He had muscles and stamina. And we can see his power as he drove the money changers from the temple. As he calmed the storms. As he raised the dead. As he healed the blind and the lame and the halt. We see that. You not only see the character, but in verse number 10, in the second part of that verse, the Shulamite woman looks at her beloved and she calls him the chiefest among 10,000. She says this, When you see him, you'll recognize him because there's nobody like him. There's nobody like my Jesus. Nobody. And as you go through, we're to praise Him. Isn't He worthy of our praise today? He's worthy of that. Because as you go back into the book of the Revelation, chapter number 4, the church has been what? Raptured out. And then you see the creatures... And you see the four and the twenty elders circling the throne. What are they saying? Holy, holy, holy. And they fall on their face and they worship Him. You get into chapter number 5 and you read in chapter number 5 that they began to weep because they could not find one that was worthy to take and to open the book thereof. He says, don't worry. Because there is a lion of the tribe of Judah that is worthy to take and to open the seals thereof. And you find in chapter number 5, later on in that chapter, that there they are doing what? 
They are offering praise and worship and glory to the Lamb of God. Why? Because He's worthy. He's worthy of our praise. Our beloved had entered the valley of death. He had faced down sin. He had faced down Satan. He had faced down the grave and carried it off in victory. You go through and you read where he is praised by the angels in Revelation chapter number 5. You go through and you'll read how he is praised by the redeemed over in Revelation chapter number 7. Why? Those that came out of great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. There's nobody like him. There's nobody like him. And if the church doesn't brag on him, who will? Who will? See, the Bible tells us in the book of Philippians, chapter number 2 and verse number 9 through 11, Wherefore God himself, the Father himself, hath also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, in things of the earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to who? To the glory of God the Father. One day, listen to me very closely. One day, every saint and sinner. One day, every angel and created being. One day, every demon and Satan himself. Every king, every prince, every dictator, every president, every elected official, every celebrity, every dignitary, every famous and infamous person is going to bow a knee to the one from whom all glory consists and goes. Why? Because we've seen the character of the bridegroom, we've seen the caliber. Of the bridegroom. Every person that has ever lived will one day bow before his feet in humility and worship the King of Kings. Why? Because there's nobody like him. There's no one like him. Charles W. Fry put it this way as I close this morning I have found a friend in Jesus, he's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and to make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, and in trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. Why? Because he's the lily of the valley, the bright and the morning star. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. Stand with me if you would. I believe every person that comes into the house of God on any given day is here by divine appointment. God knew you would be here. God knew exactly what you needed. You may be here today and you don't know Christ as your personal Savior. Can I tell you that He loves you? There's nothing like Him. There's no one like Him. One that went to Calvary and bore your sin and my sin, that you might have opportunity to go to heaven to be with Him. Dear Christian, what excitement is that to us? That our beloved would do that. Oh, He stands at the door today even and He knocks. We open the door. We open the door. You hear and you don't know Christ? Will you trust this one that gave His life and paid your sin debt today? Will you open your heart's door and say, You know what? I need a Savior in order to go to heaven. I need a Savior in order to have a place prepared for me because He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by Him. 
dear Christian? What have we missed over the years? As he stood and he knocked on our heart's door and we didn't get up to go to the door to unlock it. To let him in. So that he could come in. And sup with us. To have that relationship that he longs for. That intimate relationship of love. You may be here today and you're not 100% sure if you died, that you'd go to heaven. We're not going to embarrass anybody. We'd never drag you down an aisle or anything. The only thing I'd like to do today is pray for you that the Lord would give you as the Spirit of God deals with your heart, that He would give you the courage to come and let us take the Word of God, not my opinion, show you from His Word how you can be saved and on your way to heaven and know it. Dear Christian, what have we missed? As He stands and He bangs on our heart's door, and we quench the Spirit of God and hinder Him. What have we missed? Would you come today? Say, God, there's no one like you. You're all that and more. Father, this is your invitation. It's not mine. My words today could not convey your glory and your splendor. Just mere words can't do that. Holy Spirit God, there may be someone here that doesn't know you. As Savior, I pray to your God that they'll come today. Let us show them how that you loved them so much that your Son was sent to die for them. Father, I pray to your God for Christians today. May our hearts and our minds be open and our eyes fixed on you. Have this your will and way as you invite us to come. For it's in Jesus' name. His heads are bowed and eyes.